Good evening, everyone. So we're going to start uh, our video on diagnosis of syphilis. For the past four weeks, we have been covering different aspects of syphilis. We have covered primary, secondary, and tertiary syphilis. And last week, we we finished the congenital syphilis. And I thought I, it's better to discuss the diagnosis of syphilis together in a separate video because that uh, we need to understand and make uh, sure that we know the concepts behind each of these tests that we are going to talk about today. And and uh, the reason behind that is there is often a lot of confusion between uh, how to interpret different kind of tests, what to do when we have, let's say, Titus or 1 to 4 or VDRL, what should we go, uh, what should we do now? And in many scenarios, we might get a bit dumbfounded because we don't know what is uh, actually, what the tests are actually measuring when to do that and uh, what protocol should we follow uh, in ordering tests whether we should always do a vdr with tpha or we can uh, order tpha first or vdrl afterwards so these are some queries that i got when i asked for some uh, doubts regarding the diagnostic test so i thought that uh, in one single video we'll discuss nearly nearly around about all different kind of uh, diagnostic tests for syphilis and also discuss the principle behind each of these tests and uh, if we know the principle or, and the workings of the test we'll be in a better position to understand when are we ordering this test and how to actually interpret the results okay so uh, with, without further any uh, we will not waste much time and we'll move forward with diagnostic test and of syphilis okay let's start So this is uh, this is I've taken an article from 2021 that new cases of syphilis annually was about 60 lakhs and fetal and neonatal deaths were about 3 lakhs and early infant mortality risk was about 2.15 lakhs. Now uh, because of the rising trends of syphilis uh, currently uh, in the past few decades after an, an initial dip when penicillin was discovered. The rising risk of syphilis is kind of uh, uh, an emerging, not an emerging, but a re-emerging uh, public health problem. And so it's very important that we understand uh, and try to recognize syphilis. I've been telling the same thing for the past many videos that we need to diagnose it early so that we are able to treat it early. And uh, if we know that the diagnostic test, when should we order it, what to do if it comes out to be negative, but clinically we are thinking about syphilis, we are going to discuss that in this presentation. But this is just to show that the syphilis trend is rising uh, in the past coming years. So we need to be very, uh, very, you could, you should, we should be very, very careful uh, not to miss any cases of syphilis, okay? As we have discussed previously in, in the previous uh, video series on syphilis, that syphilis is actually a systemic disease from the onset. That means the, the moment the patient develops primary chancre, the disease is systemic in its onset. It has started to spread throughout the body to other organs. Now, uh, why diagnostic tests are important and why diagnosing, uh, diagnosing syphilis is actually important? Because primary chancre can heal spontaneously without any treatment so if it heals the patient does not uh, has a, uh, the patient has not received any treatment so they are still uh, the treponyms are still in the system and the patient can further infect other people the rash of secondary syphilis can be transient and relapsing and may be ignored by the untrained eye and as as venereologists it's our duty that we do not miss the secondary syphilitic rash and most importantly tertiary syphilis can be devastating so, uh, two weeks prior, we had a video on tertiary syphilis and we discussed the different devastating manifestations of tertiary syphilis, the gamma, the bone lesions, the cardiac involvement, the brain involvement, all of the involvements are devastating. So, it's better that we diagnose syphilis early and treat it properly. And if it goes undiagnosed, the increased transmission can lead to, uh, leads to increased spread of syphilis among the population. If syphilis is untreated in parents, it may lead to congenital syphilis and it, it affects a victim who is innocent. There is no, pro, there is no uh, the, the, the baby has not done anything, but they are still getting infected by syphilis because the pa parents were not able to get treatment properly and on time. And last, treatment is easy and possible with timely diagnosis. So we need to timely diagnose the infection because treatment with penicillin is actually easy and uh, one of, uh, and the best treatment for syphilis is actually penicillin only. Okay, let's move forward. 
there are some issue inherent with the diagnostic test so there are major there are a lot of issues with each and every test uh, some of the tests share these issues among themselves and uh, but we need to have a broad understanding what are the shortcomings of each of these tests. First of all, they're invasive. Most of the tests require blood samples, okay? But there are tests being developed which will be able to diagnose syphilis with saliva sample, making it a lot better uh, non-invasive test for diagnosing syphilis. The non-treponemal tests are non-specific, okay? Because they are they are active against the antigens which are not specifically related to spirochetes, okay? The treponemal tests they do not change with treatment. So if we just draw a diagram with treatment or not, the positivity of treponemal tests, sorry, the positivity of non-treponemal tests will increase after treatment, okay? But the pos the positivity of uh, uh, treponemal test will remain constant. So treponemal test will remain constant while the non-treponemal test will vein off with treatment. Okay, if we give treatment, let's say here. Okay, so because the treponemal test don't show any decrease with treatment, they do not change with treatment and you can, cannot monitor the patient by using treponemal test. Okay, so you won't know whether the patient is treated they have received the treatment or they are still infective based only on treponemal test. The nucleic acid amplification tests are not freely available. It's an issue with the NATS and other uh, POCDs, point of care test. A every test has variable sensitivity and specificity. And the dark ground illumination microscopy, which is one of the best tests to visualize the treponyms, actually see the treponyms. Uh, requires good knowledge and a good working microscope capable of uh, illuminating and using the dark ground illumination principle. So these are some inherent issues. There are a lot of other issues. We'll discuss them separately. But uh, these are the major, major issues with each of the different types of diagnostic test. So this slide we have discussed previously in, in individual syphilis lecture, but if in, in any case of uh, venereological disease that you have to discuss as a short note or as a viva, to diagnose uh, any disease, particularly syphilis in this context, you have to first, uh, you can either directly identify the organism, you see the organism with your own eyes, or you do serological tests, that means test on patient's serum against the antibodies that are indicative of infection, either past, present or, or recurrent infections. Or you have point of care tests, which are rapid tests. So that is rapid and very good sensitivity and specific, uh, specificity is there for the test. So this can be done rapidly just near the patient so that uh, they can have uh, the care can be given as soon as possible. Now for direct identification, you can either have dark field microscopy or dark ground illumination microscopy. We know of direct fluorescent antibodies, PCR. I will not be discussing biopsy because I have discussed them individually with the individual videos uh, before today. And electron microscopy is used only for research purposes. We will discuss in detail about non-treponemal and treponemal specific tests and with a, with a short uh, one or two slides on point of care test because point of care tests require an individual video on its own regarding point of care test in STIs. It's a very important topic. I have done at least two seminars during my chairship on this topic only. So point of care tests are important, but maybe if uh, a lot of people want it, maybe I can dig up my old seminar and do it. Let's move forward. Okay, so now we're going to start our discussion on direct visualization of spirochetes. In this group of tests, we'll see the spirochetes there or we'll see the uh, level of infection. We'll directly observe the spirochetes. That's why they are known as direct visualization of the organism. So we'll start first with dark ground illumination or, or we also know it as dark field microscopy. Okay, DFM, dark field microscopy. Now, DGI is an optical microscopy illumination technique okay it's a technique illumination technique to enhance the contrast in unstained sample so the staining is not involved we don't stain the organism like we uh, usually use gram stain or zinnelson stain to stain individual organism in dgi you don't require staining now what is the principle behind dgi the axial rays are blocked using a circular condenser okay you have the axial rays axial rays are directly 
they are coming in a straight line perpendicular uh, to the specimen and they have they are now reaching to your eye that's normally happens in normal light microscope the axial rays are the rays that reach your eyes and you see the organism these axial rays are blocked using a circular condenser and the specimen is actually illuminated by inclined rays so the rays which pass uh, at an oblique angle and they they interact with the specimen at an angle these are the rays which gets absorbed okay all other rays are blocked so the rays coming from the background is blocked and the background appears dark while only the specimen is highlighted because of the rays which get incidented on sorry incident on the organism are observed okay i'll explain it later uh, in the next slide so only the diffractive rays that pass uh, alongside the specimen reach the objective lens and are able to visualize and we are able to see so the background appears dark but the organism appears bright so this is a schematic diagram of a dark ground in a dark ground illumination microscopy you have the light source and you have a circular condenser so you can see it here okay this is the same here so you have a condenser in which you it's blocked it's like a donut shape a flat disc shape with a hole in the center so what it does it 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 blocks all the layer all the sun oh sorry not the sun all the light rays in the center and only the edges the rays at the edges are allowed to pass through so from here onwards you will get just a circle a ring of light coming out okay now this ring the this ring of uh, light gets condensed by the condenser lens okay and this is a specimen this is the specimen so only the oblique can you see that they are now coming at an angle while in a light microscope you would have had straight lines now the lights are coming at an angle and if this is the spirochete okay if light is coming at an oblique it will get diffracted so what do we mean by that light is coming obliquely it will just bend it won't get blocked by the organism or it won't get uh, you could say uh, it, it, the the bent light is what we actually see and all the light from the background is blocked so you don't see any light coming from the background that's why the background appears dark so the light ray which is just from the uh, just coming from the boundary of the specimen is what reaches our eyes so here you can see from the light source you have a condenser lens the condenser lens condenses the ring of light and only the light which is incident on the specimen only at the edges of the specimen is what eventually reaches our eye okay and that is why we are able to see only the specimen which diffracts the light which bends the light so that it is not lost outside otherwise all other lights are lost you don't see any other light rays which would have come from the background but we don't see them so the ground the field is dark so it's a dark field microscopy so the procedure is that you have to take in consent from the patient before any procedure keep the microscope ready and focused clean the shanker with normal saline and you squeeze the shanker to release a clean and clear exudate there should not be any blood contamination by blood should not be there otherwise it will give false positive or a lot of background noise in dark ground illumination microscopy you take the exudate on an upside the upside down cover slip now what do we mean by that that if this is the shanker you squeeze it so that the fluid comes out and then you use a cover slip upside down like this 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 is the direction and just touch it just touch the serous fluid and the fluid will kind of get the fluid gets attached on the un underside so this is this whole surface is covered on the underside the fluid gets attached and then you put it on the slide and you visualize it okay so you put on a slide and immediately view on 10x you focus on 10x and then eventually under 100x under oil immersion you see the organisms okay so this is how how you're going to see this pyrochetes appear thicker they appear very bright so they will appear thick thicker than they usually are uh, extremely bright shiny and these are specks could be just you know dust particles who are also diffracting the light but look at the background the background is dark because no light is reaching our eyes from the background that is why it is dark film microscopy 
But there are certain inherent uh, pitfalls, certain inherent disadvantages of dark tone elimination that you require certain experience in order to interpret the results. You should be able to, uh, you should know how to set up a dark tone elimination microscope. You should know how to take a sample. Since you're not staining it, the sample should be fresh. Wet sample, ideally you have to examine it uh, within 20 minutes of taking the sample. Otherwise, the glass slide will dry up. If it's a dirty slide, the dust particles can also show brightness. Like in the previous picture, we saw that even little light particles, sorry, little dust particles can also diffract light and appear very brighter. And if it's a, if, it, if, the, if the slide has a lot of dust particles, you might not be able to see the treponins because of the background noise. The bright light coming from the condenser can actually harm the eyes. It can even harm the sample. DGI cannot differentiate among other treponyms. So for DGI, a treponym is a treponym. Whether it's pallidum, it's pertune, okay, or it's any other non-pathogenic treponyms, it cannot. You cannot differentiate treponyms on DGI. You can just know that there are treponyms. False negative uh, sample on DGI can occur because of dry sampling. Or if the shanker is clean, so the treponyms are not there in the serous fluid. If it is clean with spirit, the treponyms are dead. If the treponyms are less, for example, in later stages of syphilis, when the quantity of treponyms go down, you might not be able to get enough treponyms to see through DGI. And if the patient receives treatment, the treponyms won't be there for us to see in DGI. The second visualization test is direct fluorescent antibody uh, test or you could say direct fluorescent uh, uh, antibody absorption test. That's what ABS means. Okay, ABS doesn't mean antibodies. It means absorption. Absorption, okay. So it's a type of immunofluorescence assay in which monoclonal or polyclonal antibodies detect treponema pallidum antigens. So in this test, we are detecting antigens, okay. So you collect the sample as per you have collected a sample for background illumination microscopy. You fix it and then you incubate the sample with conjugated antibodies. So what happens is that you have taken the sample. You have treponym antigens from the patient's exudate the serum and then you incubate it with antibodies. Okay. And then because using the, uh, the principle of immunofluorescence. Uh, we all know that how immunofluorescence actually work. You have an antibody and then you have a detecting antibody. Now this detecting antibody is going to attach itself to the antibodies and will lead to fluorescence. And this fluorescence is what we see through an immunofluorescence microscope. So you require, this test requires an immunofluorescence microscopy. And using this special type of microscope, you can see the result. Now remember in DGI, you can actually modify a normal light microscope to become a DGI. But with direct source and antibodies, you require a special type of microscope to visualize it, the test. Now it doesn't, uh, the test does not depend on motility because you're using, uh, here you're using antibodies. Now these antibodies are specific for treponema pallidum. So you, you have specifically designed monoclonal or polyclonal antibodies against treponema pallidum, okay, against the T pallidum. So only T pallidum will show positivity. Now, now this T pallidum can be T pallidum pallidum, which causes syphilis, or T pallidum pertune, uh, which causes other, uh, other, other uh, non-pathogenic, non-syphilitic treponyms. Okay, so uh, it doesn't depend on modality. For example, in dark ground illumination microscopy using a wet mod, you can actually see the mobile organisms. And uh, in the video on primary syphilis, I told about the six different movements of treponyms. So it doesn't depend on modality. It's easier to interpret because the treponyms appear shiny, they are colored, and they can distinguish between treponym of pallidum and non-pathogenic spirochetes, but not other pathogenic treponyms. Because these antibodies, these antibodies, the blue one, can show cross-reactivity among different treponyms, okay? So different treponyms or different pathogenic treponyms can get attached to these antibodies. So DFAB test is not able to distinguish among different pathogenic treponyms, but non-pathogenic and pathogenic can be differentiated because these antibodies can differentiate it. Okay, so here you are you are using the antibodies to detect antigens. Clear? The procedure is that you take a blood sample you, because you are detecting antigens in patient sera, and patient sera has antitreponema antibodies. You have a you have a slide. 
let me just draw a slide so it's easier to understand so you have a slide and in this slide you have nickel strain now remember that video on primary syphilis nickel strain was the first initially isolated treponema strain uh, cultured in rabbit testes which are used for experimental test procedures now nickel strain let me just mark it nickel strain are put on slide and then a treated serum is added and then you added the serum after the serum is added, the antibodies in the serum gets attached to treponema pallidum in nickel strain. When that antibody antigen interaction has taken place, you add the goat anti human Ig FITC labeled. FITC is, an, is a dye, it's a green colored dye. Okay, it's a, it's a green colored dye which we use to visualize these antigen antibody complexes. They attach to the antibody serum and nickel strain TP. This, this has formed a complex here and attachment to this complex via the FITC labeled antibodies leads to the immunofluorescence. Okay, and then you use a special microscope called immunofluorescence microscope and you label it plus one to plus four depending on severity or negative if you cannot see the fluorescence. Okay. Okay, so that's how it, it is actually visualized. You can see this bright green colored corkscrew shaped long filamentous uh, uh, pathogenic bacteria that is the syphilic, uh, syphilitic treponema pallidum. But like any diagnostic test, even DFAB has some pitfalls, some disadvantages. It has not been validated for clinical use, it is not FDA cleared. Technically, it is complex and it requires a special microscope, the immunofluorescence microscope. It can remain positive for years after treatment. You require a blood sample, so that makes it invasive. You require a you know, venipuncture. Cross reactivity with the other antibodies, uh, antibodies can occur. So, like we said, that pathogenic treponema pallidum cannot be distinguished. It can distinguish between non-pathogenic and pathogenic, but further among pathogenic TP, we cannot distinguish using VFAB. So in this uh, graph, you can see that VDRL gradually decreases with time. So before treatment and after treatment for six months, after treatment 12 months, VDRL constantly decreasing. Okay, but DFAB is it takes it is decreasing but very slow so it may remain positive for a long time even after taking treatments so that's a big disadvantage of that the third is polymerase chain reaction i will not be covering it in detail because it took, uh, it's uh, you just need to know that pcr chain exists in pcr you you look for nats which is nucleic acid amplification testing it can differentiate among treponins see Pathogenic treponyms are different genetically. Okay, so genetically one treponym is different from other treponym. And if you uh, amplify a specific genetic material from a specific treponym pallidum, you can easily see what treponym is, uh, for what kind of treponym is. For example, let's say you have Pertune, uh, let's, let's say you have uh, non-pathogenic syphilis, and then you have treponema pallidum pallidum. So this is treponema pallidum pallidum. This is Treponema pallidum pertune. Let me write it as this pertune. And then you have non pathogenic treponin. Now, these are different, they, they have different genetic material among them. Okay. And if you amplify, if let's say this gets amplified, this gets increased in concentration, you'll be easily able to see, you're easily able to say that we are isolating Treponema pallidum pallidum. Okay, so if genes are amplified, you can see, you can say from which organism the genes are coming. So you can easily diagnose it uh, as treponema, pallidum, pallidum. You can easily distinguish between different treponyms. So multiplex PCR agree, uh, exists that isolate or diagnosis HSV1 to H ducurine syphilis together. One sample is needed, you can diagnose it together. And uh, that is for genital ulcer diseases. And if you club this for donovanosis also, donovanosis, this is known as quadriplex. Let me just write it again. This is known as quadriplex PCR. Quadri means four. So four diseases. HSV1, 2, H. Dukkari and syphilis. Yeah. So we have discussed how to visualize the organism using DGI how to label it with a glowing fluorescent antibody in the FTABS test 
and uh, uh, how we can amplify individual genetic material uh, to to diagnose the test uh, diagnose the infection using a pcr nwt test okay the fifth is electron microscopy which is only done for research purposes we don't have to diagnose it it just gives a clearer picture of treponema pallidum organism so here you can see this pyrochit okay this pyrochit this is the same picture which i have used in the primary syphilis video so we will not go much uh, into it we'll just move forward so after the direct visualization aspect in which you actually see the organism we will now go for serology which is the most common type of test that we do in our patients apart from let's say biopsy maybe to diagnose it but we don't do biopsy that much for syphilis we rely on serological test now serological serological test can be of two types you can have treponemal or the treponemal specific test or you can have non treponemal or non treponemal specific test okay Now, treponemal tests they test for antibodies against treponemal specific antigen. For example, if you have treponema pallidum uh, organism, there are certain antigens which we have discussed in the primary syphilis video. There are certain antigens, and when a person gets infected by TB, the body will produce certain antibodies against those specific antigens. Now, these specific antigens are what these tests search for. So they will search, they will look for the infection caused by Treponema pallidum only. That is why it, they remain positive throughout life. Because once a person has been infected by Treponema pallidum, the antibodies are going to survive. and they will survive lifelong by the igg antibodies we all know that in initial phase of infection you have igm antibodies and gradually this igm antibodies decline and are replaced by igg type of antibodies and since this antibodies are going to stay for the entire life or they might get decrease in, in uh, levels or might not but mostly they stay in the system for entire life and since treponema test detect the antibodies Uh, they they are positive throughout your life okay while the non treponemal test they test for antibodies against other molecules that are released with treponemal infection and damage so whenever a treponema is infecting uh, a person it will lead to cellular cellular damage and because of this cellular damage the person will release certain biomarkers certain molecules in the system and the immune system are going to form antibodies against those molecules and non treponemal test will test for those antibodies okay now the non treponemal test as are looking for antibodies against other molecules okay other molecules they are not treponema specific so they will decrease with time when the damage is subsiding with treatment or naturally without any treatment the treponemal test can become negative so so they show decreasing titers with time or with treatment because the damage is now uh, reduced the titers also reduce okay clear now we know why treponemal test remain positive throughout while ntt uh, will decrease with time or treatment why do we rely so much on serological test because organism the treponema pallidum is difficult to culture so we know that rabbit test is is the only living organ in which you can actually grow treponema pallidum and that is where we store the nickel strain to okay so it is difficult to culture it doesn't grow without any uh, tissue uh, tissue to grow on that is why we have to rely on serology and when we say serology we majorly mean antibodies okay antibodies against tb infection lesions may not be present in latent stages so we all know that syphilis has a primary secondary then a long latent and then a tertiary phase tertiary okay so in the latent phase there might not be any lesions to test samples may miss treponemes for example you may not get enough treponemes or the patient has received the treatment and you won't get enough treponemes to actually directly visualize so you need to rely on serology in serology quantitative titers are possible for example you can find the titers you can have quantity uh, in titers for example 1 is to 4 One is to eight. One is to sixteen. That means you are diluting it every time, so you can have different quantity of titers, and they can be response with therapy. For example, titers will improve 
let's say the titus was 1 is to 32 at the start of treatment and after two months it is now 1 is to 4 that means it is uh, the patient is, is uh, responding to treatment the titers are decreasing and this is what we are speaking in the context of non treponema specific test because remember treponema test will remain positive throughout life but entities will decrease with time so we use entities to look at the response of treatment the treponema tests have good sensitivity so if these become positive it's highly likely the person has infection uh, uh, if this becomes negative if they don't have infection. So this, uh, that is the advantage of treponemal test. They are good confirmatory test. But in the end, we'll study how we can actually use a reverse algorithm to diagnose syphilis. So look at this diagram. When the infection starts, this is the time of infection. The first antibody to rise is treponemal IgM. Remember, in any infection, IgM rises first. Okay, so you have treponym, treponym and, uh, IgM which rises during the primary syphilis phase. But as the secondary syphilis phase is about to end and the patient is going to latent phase, the IgM antibody decreases and becomes zero. Roughly before two years. Roughly before two years. Now this treponym specific anti, uh, antibody, uh, sorry, antibodies get replaced by non treponym or treponym non-specific IgM IgG antibodies. If the patient receives treatment, they get very rapidly reduced, ne uh, reaching near zero after treatment, after a long course of treatment, uh, long course after the treatment has been given. But if the patient does not receive any treatment, it still decreases a bit, but then it reaches a plateau. So even with or without treatment, the entity levels will decrease, but they will reach zero if the patient has received treatment and they will not reach zero if there is no treatment. Clear? The third graph is a treponymal specific IgG. Now this is IgG. IgG means chronic. That means now the infection has shifted from IgM to IgG and because this IgG is, uh, is, uh, is going to remain positive throughout, the treponemal test remain positive throughout life. Okay, so this is chronic. Okay, so we can see that it forms a plateau with or without treatment. The plateau is going to be there. And since treponemal specific tests look for these IgG, it's going to remain positive uh, in the latent and tertiary stage. In all, nearly in all stages of syphilis, you will have positive treponemal test and it will remain positive throughout the life even if the patient has received treatment. That is why you check the response using non treponemal tests which are going to decline with treatment. Clear? No confusion from here? Let's move forward. So we'll start a discussion on non treponemal. This is a non treponemal test. We will start a discussion on non treponemal test. The first test is Wasserman test which is the first blood test used to diagnose syphilis. It's an antibody test based on complement fixation. It was the first test ever to, to use blood as a sample to diagnose syphilis. It is also the first non treponemal test of course. The sample used is blood or CSF sample and an uh, and antigen which is derived from bovine muscle, cow muscle or heart, okay? So what happens is, it in Wasserman test, the antigen tested is cardiolipin. And cardiolipin is a very important constituent of the mitochondrial membrane. So when mitochondrial membrane, or mammalian mitochondrial membrane, membrane gets damaged, cardiolipin is released in the system. The immune system will recognize cardiolipin and form antibodies against it. So you will form antibodies to cardiolipin. And these are the antibodies which we check using Wasserman test. So what happens is you take a sample, you take antibodies which are present in the patient sample and then you add cardiolipin which is derived from cow. Okay, cow heart or cow muscle. And these two are put together. And the sample will flocculate. Why it will flocculate? Because the sample has, this patient has antibodies against cardiolipin. And these antibodies, when they come into contact with cardiolipin, it will lead to flocculation or the sample will become murkier and cloudy. Okay? And depending on the amount of cloudiness, it is going to uh, come, come, come together. The sample will come together and settle down at the base of the test tube. 
and the level of settling can be labeled as 1, 2, 3 or 4 directly proportional to severity. Nowadays, the Wasserman test has been replaced by VDR and RPR. Okay. So here you can see in a in a uh, test tube you have taken patient serum and you have added cardiolipin extracted from bovine heart and muscle and the sample has flocculated. Okay, so look look at this the sample has settled down. So this is a plus four reaction plus four Wasserman reaction and depending on the severity of flocculation the extent of flocculation you label it as plus four plus three. Let me just write it here. Uh, plus 4, plus 3, plus 2, plus 1, doubtful and negative if, if there is no flocculation. That is the Wasserman test, the first test. Now, Wasserman test has been replaced by VDRL or RPR now. That is the most commonly used non treponemal test. VDRL stands for Venereal Disease Research Laboratory. It is in US. Now, the name has changed. I think I don't uh, remember the new name. I, did, I think it is Treponema Pallidum investigation and research laboratory I'll, I'll i'll find out the new name of this laboratory and put it in the comments so vdrl test stands for venereal diseases research laboratory it's a very good screening test it's the screening test that we commonly use now it is simple sensitive low cost csf vdrl is highly specific but the sensitivity is low in csf vdrl you use csf instead of patient's serum VDRL becomes positive in the first few weeks after infection. It peaks during first year and then slowly decline. So if you remember the graph chart on the non-treponemal IgM, that it's kind of mimicking the VDRL positivity. Okay, so it becomes, it uh, starts with, within the first few weeks after infection, peak during first year and then slowly decline. That is how IgM also behaves. And since VDRL is recognizing antibodies, which are IgM in nature and non non treponemal specific in nature, the same graph is going to be followed by VDRL. It's a macroscopic test. That means you don't require a microscope to visualize the test. You can see it with your own eyes and label it as plus and minus. VDRL can become negative without treatment. Uh, in 25% of patients, roughly one-fourth patients can show negativity of VDRL without any treatment. We know that VDRL decreases with treatment. So, if this is the VDRL positivity, if the patient has received treatment here, or it can increase and stay here without treatment. The extent of downward slope can also reach there in some patient, in 25% of patient without treatment. So, if the patient uh, is VDRL negative, either the antibodies are not there or you have prozon phenomena or the, it's one of those one out of four patients which can become negative. The sensitivity increases with the stage of syphilis. For example, in primary syphilis, if you remember the graph, primary syphilis was somewhere here. So in primary syphilis, the sensitivity is 75%, while in secondary syphilis, it reaches to about 100%. The shortcomings are prozone phenomena, or you can have biological false positive. We'll discuss each of them in one slide afterwards. So the procedure is that you take a glass slide, you add the patient's serum, the patient's serum has antibodies. Now these are IgM non-treponemal antibodies against cardiolipin. Then you have the agent that has cardiolipin, cardiolipin, less, lecithin, I will write it again, cardiolipin, lecithin, cholesterol. So these are the constituents of the reagent here. These are the reagent. You add it and when you add them, they will come together and form complexes. And when these kind of complexes are formed, the sample flocculates or the sample becomes murkier and you can actually see it. And if the flocculation has occurred, the patient is said to be VDRL positive. If it shows positive or negative, then it's a qualitative VDRL. If it shows titus like 1 is to 4 or 1 is to 16, it is a quantitative VDRL. And it's, be it's always better to get a quantitative VDRL done so that you can actually know the titus. Clear? If no flocculation occurs, if it remains like this, then it is VDRL negative. Okay? 
Now, what is biological false positive? Biological false positive is presence of a positive VDRL reaction in a patient who does not have syphilis. Okay, it is seen in one to two percent of patients. Many times you will see patients coming to you with a positive VDRL test report and no other features of syphilis, no history suggestive of syphilis, TPH is negative. What has happened? He has had a biological false positive. Now, what do we know? Now? Why do we call it as false uh, biological false positive and not only false positive? Because false positive is because of a uh, an inherent problem with the test. For example, if you have a test a okay let's say you have a test a and there are some problems or some problems with the reagent use some problem with the procedure use and it is leading to a positive test that is false positive but in biological false positive the test is working absolutely fine but the chemicals that the test wants to measure is also present in other disorders so positive result will come but it's not because of syphilis, it's because of other disorders. Titus usually remain low, less than 1 is to 8. So uh, many times you will see less than or equal to 1 is to 8. It's because the titers are low because it might, might be a biological false positive. You require a treponema specific test to be sure. Diseases like infection, immunization, pregnancy is very commonly seen, uh, biological false positive condition, age-related changes, any other autoimmune disorders like APLA, SLE, RA. Now, these all disorders lead to uh, intense cellular damage, releasing cardiolipin in the system. So, the patient doesn't have syphilis. It has other sources, other reasons for cardiolipin. And because of that, the VDRL is positive, even IV drug abusers. Okay. For example, once I had a consultation during my SRship in which a person had a significant stroke and because of the stroke, the VDL was 1 is to 4. TPH of course negative. You have to always confirm a positive VDRL with a treponemal test to be sure because treponemal tests are more sensitive and they may remain positive even with treatment. So if TPH comes out to be negative and the titers are low of VDRL, most likely it's a biological false positive otherwise uh, if the vdrl is positive and tph is also positive it might be because of syphilis so in the last slide we discuss biological false positivity of vdrl we'll now discuss the prozone phenomena now prozone phenomena is very important it's a good short note it's a good question uh, in viva if you if your case is of syphilis in sti you will be asked prozone phenomena if the viva is going on the investigation and diagnosis of syphilis now what do we mean by prozone phenomena it is also known as hook effect or antibody excess phenomena and i'll tell you uh, why it is known as hook effect it, it is it is also known as post zone not also but the other corollary is post zone phenomena or antigen excess prozone phenomena is because of antibody excess while post zone phenomena is because of antigen excess it's an immunological phenomena which means effectiveness of antibodies to form immune complexes is decreased or impaired when the antibodies are present in a very high concentration okay so we, so whenever the antibodies are in a high concentration in serum the and the antigens are less the complexes are not formed adequately and the sample might be negative so prozone phenomena is a very important reason to get false negatives okay let's discuss that in detail so look at this diagram. What we require is zone of equivalence. That's the best zone. In this, you will get positive results. You will get positive VDRL. Here, the antibodies and antigens have formed good complexes and precipitate is forming. If the antibodies are excess, if you have a lot of antibodies, you will have the prozone phenomena. Okay. So in zone of equivalence, you will get proper result. The test is okay. While in prozone, because of a lot of antibodies, the complexes are not formed properly and there will be no flocculation, there will be no result. In post zone, the antigens are in higher concentration than antibodies and they will occupy everything and complexes will not be formed. Okay, so look at here. Each, anti, each antigen is kind of connected to two antibodies, the complexes are formed. It is kind of bringing everything together. But here, 
they are not all of the sites all of the sites of the antibodies are covered by antigens because antigens are in very high number so every site is covered and because covering every site is not able they are not able to form immune complexes you are having a post zone phenomena so let's see here you have two different kind of antibodies you have detecting antibodies and you have capturing antibodies okay so you have a slide and then you have detecting antibodies these are the antibodies uh, from the patient's serum sorry uh, these are the antibodies which are uh, coated on the glass slide okay and then you have the antigens in this you add the patient serum and if the antibody are in adequate concentration adequate concentration complexes are formed when complexes are formed it will lead to flocculation and the test is positive so here the test is okay the test is okay and this is known as the zone of equivalence this is the best zone or the uh, or the optimum concentration of antigen antibody to form a reaction but in prozon you still have the same slide same concentration of detecting antibodies but here the antigen sorry the antibodies the capturing antibodies are high in number in patient serum so if you have the same number of antigens but the antibodies are high and the immune complexes are not formed properly and this leads to prozon because the immune complexes are not formed flocculation doesn't take place and here in the post zone phenomena you have the same the uh, normal number of uh, capturing antibodies in patient serum but the antigen used is a lot and all the sites are occupied by antigens and the complexes are not formed properly and you don't have a flocculation this is known as post zone so in post zone phenomena and in pro zone phenomena you will have false negative so it's it's advisable to keep on diluting till you reach an optimum concentration okay so that is why uh, if you suspect that a patient has syphilis but vdr is still coming out to be negative it's better that you tell the laboratory that it could be a case of prozon phenomena and they will dilute these uh, samples so that you have you reach adequate concentration when when you dilute the patient serum the antibody concentration will decrease and you will actually enter zone of equivalence and have a good positive vdr okay i hope the prozon phenomena is clear and uh, you'll be easily able to answer questions and write short note on what is prozon phenomena now prozon phenomena is usually seen in syphilis with hiv because in hiv there is excessive altered b cell stimulation the b cells are excessively stimulated so a lot of antibodies are created there is increased antibodies but these antibodies are not able to surmount a good immune response against syphilis so their concentration will keep on increasing they will keep on interfering with vdrl test and leading to prozon phenomena okay you have to dilute serums to enter the zone of equivalence if the serum has a lot of antibodies you keep on diluting them so that the concentration decreases other conditions that can show prozon phenomena are pregnancy different phase of syphilis for example in early syphilis you can have a, have a bombardment of antibodies that's why increasing concentration of antibodies you can also have immunosuppression or neurosyphilis neurosyphilis will keep on forming see in neurosyphilis the treponema is alive in csf okay it it will keep on forming antibodies there and the antibodies will keep on leaking in the serum but in the, but when you take a blood sample you will not have uh, that much antigens in in contrast to antibodies and you will have a prozon phenomenon the next non treponemal test is rapid plasma reagent what is what do we mean by reagent reagent means substances which are released by cells when they are damaged by treponema pallidum and in rpr you look for antibodies against these biomarkers so this is the principle behind non treponemal tests that you look for bio, uh, antibodies against biomarkers released from cells which are damaged by treponema pallidum now these biomarkers are cardiolipin and lecithin so in this uh, test you don't look for antibodies per se you just look for the antigens now directly antigens that's why it is reagent antigen reagent okay while in vdr you were looking at the antibodies capturing antibodies against cardiolipin and lecithin yeah remember the pink arrow those arrows were what we looking for in vdr while in rpr you look uh, only at the antigens the sensitivity is about 86% primary about 100% in secondary syphilis and in latent it decreases to 
it's a rapid test it's in the name rapid plasma reagent it's macroscopy that you can see with your own eyes so in rpr you take 0.05 ml of sample with reagent and you put it in a in a incubator of sorts at 100 rpm for 8 minutes so here you have rpr uh, the rpr plate or the rpr card so okay so this is a card it's a cardboard on which the test takes place so i'm giving an example of three wells the first well is empty because it will be our false negative not not false negative uh, negative control it's not false negative negative control in the second one we'll put the patient serum and the third one will be positive control okay so positive control okay and you add the reagent so what happens is that the reagent will react to the antigens present in patient serum and the false negative will not show anything so it is negative control the positive control will show flocculation it has to show flocculation and the serum will also show flocculation if the patient has those antigens released because of damaged cells okay if not then no so that is the principle behind rpr rpr can be false positive in iv drug use hiv infection hepatitis b autoimmune disease or components released by bacteria which damage host cells remember damage to host cell is response is uh, important when cells are damaged you will release these antigens even uh, if the patient does not have syphilis because of cellular damage you will have release of antigens it can be false negative in early stage of syphilis or late stage of syphilis because of prozone phenomena even HIV can also lead to false negative RPR or because of human error because you have to see the flocculation with your eyes. If the person is not trained, they may report it as negative. There is one modification of RPR which is known as trust or toluidine red dye unheated serum test. Okay, that's the full form of trust. It's a modification of RPR in which the VDR supernatant is combined with ground toluidine red dye. Now remember. I'll just tell it here. RPR has charcoal, grounded charcoal inside. And this charcoal is so that you can see the visual, and you can visually see the flocculation happening in a RPR test. It becomes muddy, it becomes gray colored because of charcoal. If you replace charcoal with toluidine red dye, it leads to better visualization. And that is this modification is what we call it as trust. It is CDC approved. It's easy, cost effective. You can leave the reagents at room temperature. You don't require a fridge to store. And no glass ampules are broken, which we have to break for RPR. So you don't require, sorry, you don't require uh, use of charcoal. You replace it with toluidine blue. That is trust. It is also FDA approved. Okay, so we have finished the non-treponemal test. Now we'll come to treponemal test and this will be easy because we'll focus more on, focus only on TPHA. Okay, so in treponemal test, you have the antigens. So these antigens come from either the treponema organism or components and uh, these antigens will form antibodies in patient serum. So now the antigens will come from directly treponema organism. So in non-treponemal test, we were looking for antigens which come from cellular damage, when cell gets damaged. But in treponemal specific test, we are looking for antigens which are coming from treponema. So what happens is when treponema antigens are exposed to immunity, they will form antibodies. And these antibodies will be specific for treponema pallidum. And when these antibodies are detected using tests, so if you do tests to detect these antibodies, they become treponema specific test or, or treponemal test. So this is the essential difference between these two types of tests. In non-treponemal tests, you're looking at antibodies against antigens which are released by cell damage, while in treponemal tests, you're looking for antibodies against antigens which are released by treponema pyridum. Clear? That's why these are specific tests, those were non-specific. They become positive early before non-treponemal test and with treatment, generally the loss of antibodies do happen with treatment, but it is never zero. Okay, so it remains as an IgG antibody. 
it persists at a low level and is still detectable that is why there is lifelong positivity in treponemal test in treponemal test since igg never reaches zero it is always detectable at all stages you have a positivity which lasts throughout the life in treponemal test okay So the first treponemal test we'll discuss is enzyme immunoassay. It is very auto, it is automated and quick, and is quickly becoming the uh, the best screening test of choice. Quickly, CDC also recommends this as a screening test as a screening test, and it is also useful in congenital syphilis because in congenital syphilis they require rapid diagnosis. It is the earliest to become positive. Within three weeks, it will become positive. Okay, within three weeks of infection, so earliest to become positive. It utilizes nickel string, but the newer EIA, the enzyme immunoassay, the new enzyme immunoassay requires recombinant treponemal antigens. So, what do we mean by that? The antigens which are used to find the antibodies against treponem. In earlier EIA, it was nickel string, while the newer EIA utilizes recombinantly formed treponemal antigens against TP15, 17, and 18. 15, 17, and 40, sorry, 15, 17, and 47 are treponemal antigens which have been specially designed for enzyme immunoassay. Okay, and when these antigens are plated on a plate and patient serum is added, if there are any antibodies which gets attached to these, these will be detected by the test. Okay, so here. In enzyme immunoassay, it's an immuno method, immunochromatographic method, which is automated and quick, in which you find antibodies in patient serum against TP15, TP17, TP47. Okay. The specificity is about 99.2, sensitivity is 99%. It's quickly becoming screening test of choice and also used for congenital syphilis. The second treponemal test is chemiluminescence immunoassay or CLIA. It's a variation of enzyme immunoassay. The only difference is that in enzyme immunoassay, you don't have paramagnetic particles. You, have, you just have a slide with recombinant antigens. While in chemiluminescence immunoassay, these antigens are coated on paramagnetic particles. And because of paramagnetic particles, they, have, they release chemiluminescence uh, when uh, they are checked through a microscope, it's somewhat like an immunofluorescence, but now you're not using a dye, you're actually using paramagnetic particles coated with the antigen. So you have a paramagnetic particle in sclia. So this is a paramagnetic particle, and these are coated by uh, coated with recombinant antigens. And if antibodies are present in the serum, these antibodies are detected, and these paramagnetic particles are shiny so they will shine and depending on the amount or the intensity or the extent of shininess you can actually find the level of severity of infection so signals is directly proportional to the amount of the bound complexes and you can easily find if the shine if the if it is very shiny then the infection is of course severe if it is less shiny then the infection is not that severe the turnaround time is roughly about one hour Compared with TPPA, that's one of the most commonly used uh, treponemal tests. Compared with TPPA, the specificity of CLIA is about 99.9%, while sensitivity is nearly 100%. So this is what CLIA is, and CLIA is a treponemal test, okay? TPHA, now this is the most commonly used treponemal test that we use it daily. In TPHA, you utilize the principle of hemagglutination. What do you mean by hemagglutination? That means agglutination of blood. You see the positivity of result uh, by the agglutinated or coagulated blood. Okay. So in TPHA, you have sheep and fowl RBCs. Fowl is a type of bird. Okay. So sheep and fowl red blood cells, which are sensitized by T peridum antigen. Now this antigen is uh, uh, in vitro. That means these are not in the body, they are artificially made and you coat these antigens on the RBCs. If the patient's serum has antibodies against these antigens, it will lead to coagulation of blood. And this coagulation of blood is what we see as positive TPHA. So you have serum, you add non-pathogenic greater treponyms so that all other treponyms are blocked and only pallidum survives. And then you uh, uh, you look at, so let me just tell you again. 
if a serum is there, let's say this is serum, you add a reader treponym. Reader treponyms, what happens is it will coagulate or it will attach itself to the antibodies for non pathogenic TP and remove them from the circulation. And you will be left with antibodies against treponema pallidum. Okay, and these are the antibodies that we want to look for. So, after washing all the excess treponema antibodies using Reader's organism, you add the antibodies which are cross-linked with RBCs. Now, these are treponema pallidum antigen coated. And this will lead to a coagulation if the antibodies are there and you will see a positive TPHA. I'll explain that clear in clearly in the next slide. So, TPHA you have sheep or fowl RBCs. So, these red blood cells belong to either sheep or fowl. And these RBCs are coated with antigens. Okay. In these RBCs, you will add patient serum. So, this is from patient, patient serum. And if the patient serum has antibodies against these antigens, it will coagulate. The blood is going to coagulate and settle down like a mat at the bottom of this tube. If that settling happens, that means TPHA is positive. The fourth test is TPPA and P is particle agglutination. So in heme agglutination, we were looking at coagulation of blood. In TPPA, we will look at coagulation of particles. Nothing different is there. In TPHA, you use blood. In TPPA, instead of blood, you are using sensitized gelatin particles. So in TPHA, TPHA, you had blood. In TPPA, you had gelatin particles. That is the only difference. It requires about 2 hours of incubation. It has better sensitivity and compared to fluorescent antibody test. It is easier, less expensive and less prone to non-specific reaction. Okay. That is the only difference. In TPA, you use gelatin particles. In TPHA, you use blood. That's the difference. The fifth is multiplex flow immunoassay. Now, from these slides onwards, we'll be very quick. Because we don't routinely use these tests, we just need to know them so that we can write them in the right in our exam or answer questions. It's an automated flow cytometric assay in which you have the antibodies attached to polystyrene beads instead of a well. So in TPH or TPPA, you're using a well in which the reactions are taking place in MFA or MFI, multiplex flow immunoassay. These are polystyrene beads and which are captured by frozen signature. You just Remember that MFA is a type of flow cytometry in which you see antigen antibody complexes and in the test the antigens are treponemal antigens. The antibodies are against treponemal antigen. That is why this test is treponemal specific test. The examples are Bioplex 2200 syphilis. It, it can simultaneously detect and differentiate different uh, treponemal antibodies or ethena multilite assay. I'm just putting the names. Uh, a, a resident might not know, might not require to know it, that in this uh, much detail. Just remember that a multiplex flow immunoassay exists, which is like a flow cytometry to diagnose syphilis, in which antigen antibody complexes are analyzed using flow cytometry. Just remember this, and everything is okay. Let's move forward. In fluorescent antibody absorption test, it is same as FTA ABS test that we have discussed previously. The fluorescent label one, it's an indirect immunoassay. You use serum, neutralize all the non pathogenic uh, antibodies using T. phagogenesis. Then you have a fixed organism from an extract of tree pyridum, which is nickel strain. Again, anywhere uh, an artificial source of treponema pyridum is being used, it's from nickel strain. Okay. After, after see what 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 happens is you have a serum, then you neutralize all the other treponema by using treponema phagogenesis. Okay, so that only treponema pallidum remain. Now you add nickel strain, and this nickel strain will have antigens, and antigen antibody complexes will be formed, and these complexes are then attached to a fluorescent antibody. And this fluorescent antibody is what is detected. Okay. So, fluorescent conjugated anti-human immunoglobulin is used for visualization of the test. It requires about 1.5 hours. It's, it's kind of a sandwich ELISA. So, if you remember your biochemistry, sandwich ELISA means that you have an antigen. 
you have the patient's antibody and those complexes have another antibody which is fluorescent and you use that fluorescent antibody to see the test okay it does have a subjective interpretation because you, uh, a person actually has to see they can be uh, there's an inability to automate for large specimen numbers that's a disadvantage that a uh, few specimens can be tested it can have a lot of false positive reaction because you're relying on a fluorescent capturing antibody which can cross react to other pathogens also so false positive reaction can happen The seventh one, immunoblot assay, it's a western blot assay, it's an agent confirmatory test to resolve any issues. It is highly specific and detects IgM and IgG separately. The antigens come from the whole cell organism, while antibodies are against TB15, 17, 44.5 and 47. These are nuclear anti antibodies, okay? The only disadvantage is that it is laborious, laborious, it is tough to do, and it can have multiple non-specific reactions. And nowadays, you don't require antigens from nickel strain. You can actually make them in laboratory, the common immune assays. And the name is Enolia syphilis kit. You need not remember. Just know that there is a western blot assay by the name of immunoblot assay for syphilis. Just remember that it is a western blot. And it is very, very specific. Highly specific can be used to get rid of any confusion. But the availability and the difficulty and non-specific, some non-specific reactions, that is why we don't use this test much commonly. We use TPPA or TPHA. Okay, so last part of our presentation, the point of care test. I will not go much in detail. Point of care test is a test which is performed near or at the site of the patient and the result is immediately received so that you can decide on the treatment, okay? Most of the point of care tests are immunochromatographic in nature. For example, you have to see a visible line. This is same as all those pregnancy kits or dengue malaria kits in which you see two lines. So, if this is a test strip, this is the well in which you put patient serum, this is the window. And this is one control, that means the test is, has been done proper. And this is the test line. So if test and control, both lines are present, it is positive. If only control is present, it is negative. And if control is not present, that means the test is invalid, we have to repeat it. It takes about nearly every point of care test will require half an hour to one hour to complete. The specimens can be serum, plasma, whole blood. And studies are being going to use saliva as a sample, okay? The sensitivity is about 85 98%, specifically 93 98. You don't have to remember that one. Just remember that point. What are point of care tests? This is the actual definition. There are multiple definitions. This one would do. So, this is the definition of point of care test. And it is based on the principle of immunochromatography. It is quick and in many instances non invasive. So, you can do the test same day or, in fact, the same hour. Uh, after taking the sample from the patient and start the treatment. So, point of care test can be either conventional or non-conventional. The conventional one includes DGI, RPR, VDRL. These are those, those tests that we usually do. They are very quick and done at the bedside level. While non-conventional tests are like nucleic acid, uh, nucleic acid amplification test or immunochromatographic test. These are complex tests and newer tests. Newer. And that's why they are non-conventional tests. So, the only FDA approved point of care test is syphilis health check. But the issue is that uh, a lot of tests are get, might get further FDA approval as future uh, in the future. So, we need to keep ourselves updated regarding what all tests have been uh, approved by the FDA. The point of care test usually does not distinguish between active or past infection. This, uh, these are all uh, names of different uh, point of care tests. Uh, actually, POCT is a very complex and a very boring topic to know, frankly speaking. If you want, then I can cover sometimes in the future point of care test in STIs. But just remember that point of care tests do exist. They exist in research uh, facilities in institutions. And they provide you quick answer, uh, quick results. In fact, in US, patients can buy and test at home and then reach their doctors for treatment, okay? So, they, they require less time, cost or training, no equipment, you just need a kit. 
Uh, okay, so that is there. The problem is availability, misinterpretation, variability, qualitative analysis. These are all has to be discussed uh, in detail. But here you just remember that point of care test can be done for quick, quickly diagnosing syphilis and starting treatment, and they are done at the bedside and based on the principle of immunochromatography. Clear? Let's move forward. In nucleic acid amplification test, you amplify the nucleic acid. And what do you mean by nucleic acid? DNA. So what we do is we have spirochetes and the DNA from spirochetes is amplified and this amplified DNA is detected. Okay. So these are the genetic material which is amplified and detected. It is complementary to serology. It has not replaced serology as of now. It, it just complements serology. The specificity is about 100% sensitivity may, may vary. It is, uh, there is no commercially available NAT kits as of now. That's why it is not recommended. But still, multiple studies are going on on NAT. And maybe in future, NATs might replace, uh, replace all other treponemal and non-treponemal tests. And for to provide us with a quick diagnosis. Hmm. This is the last aspect and a very important aspect of the presentation. The reverse sequence algorithm. Now, what do we mean by reverse sequence algorithm? Normally, we first do a non-treponemal test and then we go to treponemal test. This is the CDC approved version. Okay, the Center for Disease Control has approved this. That you first do a non-treponemal test. If that comes out to be positive, you confirm it by treponemal test. So, entities are screening tests while treponemal tests are confirmatory. This is the normal sequence. But... 15 to 25 percent can become negative in two to three years with treatment in primary stage. For example, entities uh, they can become uh, with, without treatment. Okay, they can become negative without treatment in primary stage after two to three years. So let's say a patient has syphilis. The titers are now negative without treatment, and you test again with a non-treponemal test. The entity will come out to be negative. Because it's negative now after two to three years, and you will say that the patient does not have syphilis, and then you will miss a patient of syphilis, isn't it? So the reverse sequence algorithm was formulated so that we don't miss a patient of syphilis. So what do we say in reverse sequence algorithm? Is you do treponemal test first, then you do a non-treponemal test, and then you do another treponemal test which is different from the first one. Okay. You have you do a treponemal test, then you do a non-treponemal test, and then you do a different treponemal test. This is known as reverse sequence algorithm. So sequence is entity to TT, but in reverse sequence sequence algorithm, you have TT to entity, then again TT. Clear? Concept is clear. And this has led to better efficacy and prevention of undertreatment so that you don't miss cases of syphilis because the entity only is negative. So let's start. So with this uh, table, I'll just tell you in, in short, what do we mean by reverse sequence algorithm, how to use it. So in reverse sequence algorithm, you first do a treponemal test. If the treponemal test is negative, and it is a very specific and sensitive test, you don't have to do the other two. And you label it as no serological evidence of syphilis. So you don't have any evidence because the first treponemal test is negative. If the first treponemal test becomes positive, you do a non-treponemal test. This is non-treponemal test. Okay. If the non-treponemal test is also positive, if both first and second test is positive, you don't have to do the third one. You label it as syphilis because both the tests are you label it as syphilis because both the tests are positive. Clear? If first is negative, don't do anything, no syphilis. If first is positive, second is also positive, it is syphilis, don't do the third one. If the first is negative, sorry, if the uh, first is positive, you do the second test, non-treponemal test. If non-treponemal test is negative, you do the second treponemal test. But remember, the second treponemal test will be different. For example, you use EIA, enzyme amino assay first, and then you may use TPPA or uh, TPPA or TPHA. Okay, a different treponemal test. If the second treponemal test is positive, 
be labeled as syphilis. Okay. If after positivity of first treponemal test, the second is negative, the third test is negative, we label it as unlikely or early infection and repeat after three months, two to three months. Am I clear? Let revise with me. Okay, repeat after me. First treponemal test is negative, don't do anything, no syphilis. First treponemal test is positive, do a non-treponemal test. If non-treponemal test is also positive, don't do the third one, it is syphilis. If non-treponemal test is negative, do the second treponemal test, which is different from the first test. If the second treponemal test is positive, it is syphilis. If the second treponemal test is also negative, it is either unlikely syphilis or early infection. Clear? So, I'll, what I'll do is I'll remove all the markings so that you can either take a screenshot of this but it's better to understand the concept so that you don't get confused. Remember, treponemal test first, then NTT, then another different TT. And depending, if you look at the logic, you will easily able to understand why we are labeling it syphilis or non-syphilis. Okay. So, just look at it and see. Just rewind, read this part again or see, view this part again and you will be easily able to understand what is reverse sequence algorithm. Clear? So with that, we finished this long video on diagnosis of syphilis. I hope the background concepts are clear. These are some reading recommendation. Okay, these are good articles. This is a very good article. If you want to read in brief, apart from this video, how to interpret all the results or what are what are the different diagnosis diagnostic test of syphilis, read this article. For VDR, this one is good. For RPA, this one is good. For enzyme immuno acid, this one is good. And CDC URL for regarding the treatment guidelines for syphilis, it's better to go through them. They will tell you about reverse sequence algorithm or sequence algorithm and other dots will be cleared. So these are further in recommendation, but you won't require much if you go through this video again and again. With that, I finished today's video. It's a long video, so I won't take much time. And this would be the last video for some time on syphilis, maybe in venereology also. In the past five videos, primary, secondary, tertiary, congenital and diagnosis of syphilis, we have covered in detail uh, all the important aspects of syphilis that a resident should know. And if you know this much, it's very well and good. You'll be easily able to write answers, give give answers to in vivas, write answers in exams. And if you go through all of these five videos, pause it, see it again, view it again, look at 1.5x, I don't care. Just go through them and you'll be easily able to understand and your concepts regarding syphilis will be clear. Everybody is... Uh, you may uh, write an email to me if you have any doubts, any suggestions, any other queries. You can just write to me again and I'll reply it. If there are any other points, it's better to put in the comment section so that other people can also read and learn from it. Okay, with that being said, I will not take much time. Adios. Bye-bye. Take care of yourself in this cold and enjoy your weekend. Bye-bye.